Thank you for tuning in to the Business Sphere. Don't forget to subscribe and share this episode. Joining me today is Henry Dawes. He is a personal finance coach, realtor, and author of FQ, Financial Intelligence. Thanks for being on the show today, Henry. Thanks for having me, John. It's a pleasure to so, be here. I'm excited because you're from New York. I love New York. So prior to me being a father, <laughs> I used to visit there at least once a year. But before we get into your upbringing, I wanted to love for the audience members to know what's your expertise? How did you get there? And maybe share with the audience members some of the stories and tribulations and transformation. All right. Good, good jumping off point. So um, I, uh, I describe myself as a serial entrepreneur. I started my first business in 1991. Um, I graduated college in 1981, so I spent 10 years. Um, I only really had two jobs in my life during that 10, uh, 10 year period. I worked for a big multinational company, and then I worked as a computer programmer for the New York Stock Exchange. That's where I learned about software. Started my first company as a um, Apple value added reseller. People used to say, oh really, what's your, what's your value add? I used to say, me, you wanna buy your, your stuff from me. It was as simple as that. Um, since then, I've had uh, different businesses in a variety of disciplines. I had a real estate company, as you mentioned. I am uh, currently, I just, uh, in uh, this past October, I got my real estate license here in the state of Connecticut. I moved here to Connecticut uh, about a year ago. So it's the first time I'm living outside of the New York metropolitan area. It's kind of interesting. I live in the country on five acres on a dirt road. So uh, it's a little, uh, little bit of a sea change for us, but it's good. It's all good. Um, for the last 10 years, I've been coaching entrepreneurs. Uh, as you mentioned, I wrote the book FQ Financial Intelligence uh, 2018. Um, I basically give that book away. I sell a course around it, a 20-week course where I teach you pretty much everything I think you need to know about money. Uh, I also coach people sort of a la carte. For you know, 500 bucks a month, I will coach you on how to level up your your game uh, in terms of uh, managing your money and growing it. Uh, really, a DIY approach. Um, but if you wanted to use the skills that you learned to hire a pro to do it, that's good too. Whatever it is, goal is to make money. Um, what else? Uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, I'm wearing my Giants shirt here. <laughs> the season is almost over. New York Football Giants don't don't want to talk about how poor they have played. Um, but I like sports. I play golf. Uh, I do lots of stuff. So amazing. So that gives me a lot to ask uh, because this is a summary of a nutshell of 60 years. But before we get into drilling, I would like to ask you, like upbringing wise. Um, parents, do you have siblings? Um, hmm. How was it when you grew up? Um, and then what those two jobs that you had, what made you want to move to starting your own business? Um, so maybe that can get All you. Right. That's a good, started. that's a good jumping off point. Look, one of my, one of my ad lib lines, my well-rehearsed ad lib lines, is I say, I had a very normal childhood. I have the therapy bills to prove it. Um, and I did. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn. I grew up in New Jersey. My mom was straight out of Brooklyn. So was my dad. Um, but my dad was really a country boy at heart. And he wanted to move to, you know, the suburbs in the worst way possible. And so um, in the late 50s, they moved. I have a, an older sister. She's three years older than me. And I grew up in uh, suburban New Jersey public schools, you know, played football, basketball, baseball, did all the things, collected baseball cards. I still have a whole bunch of baseball cards. Um, prices have gone <laughs> haywire since the pandemic. So I kind of stopped collecting them uh, for the time being, waiting for prices to normalize. Uh, yeah, I went to school for electrical engineering, uh, although I really wanted to be a poli sci major. But my parents, especially my mom, who was a depression baby, born in 27, she was a you know, poster child for depression babies, lived her whole life in a scarcity mindset. She's like, you know, become an engineer. They're always in demand. And she was right. And I graduated 81, which is the same year that the IBM PC was released out to the world, right? Remember the old PCAT for those of us who are old enough to remember them. They were about $7,000. And I think they might have had 640K of memory. We're really going back into the archives here. Um, 
but it was a it was kind of a um, sort of a happy accident because I worked for this uh, I worked for Honeywell. I might as well tell you who it is. They're a big multinational company, and that's where I learned how to program computers. I took basic and Fortran in college, but that's when I really learned how to do it in a real paying job. And then I parlayed that to a job working for the New York Stock Exchange, building the trading systems that were used on the floor back in the eighties. But in the back of my mind, I always thought I was going to work for myself. You know, my, my dad was a middle manager engineer at a big engineering uh, company. My mom was a school teacher. Um, they worked hard. They saved their money. They invested. They always believed in investing in the stock market. So I learned about the stock market, bought my first stock when I was 17. Chrysler, for the record, uh, after the government bailed them out, and uh, haven't looked back. Um, so um, I've learned I learned my um, my money skills organically by doing, you know, not by reading the book, but but by doing it, by trading every day, and watching markets, and learning everything I can. And even with everything that I've learned, I barely scratched the surface. That's how big and vast it is. Um, anyway, I'll pause there so you can interject. <laughs> Amazing, because I just finished a book called When by Daniel Pink. And it's so mm -hmm. important to understand, like, it's not, you know, people are talking about like what profession you choose, but it's timing as well, because industries pivot based on decade long um, cycles of the global economy, right? Right now sure. we might be, going through a huge phase of crypto or, you know, energy crisis or, you know, turbulence on, you know, fractions in terms of political uh, divide, right? Sure. But then there's that tech boom, like you mentioned in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, where it was all about like automation and trying to things make things more efficient and productive while back in the maybe 40s and 50s it was all automotive right so right. when you're born makes a huge difference on what profession you choose and what your parents see and as mm -hmm. you become more wise and you become more you know global perspective you can, can kind of appreciate what their intent was at their time because that's what they saw, and they're going to try to give you guidance based on what they br brought to the table. So at that time, um, did you regret any of the choices that you made? And how was that value add reseller kind of business? And how long did you kind of keep, keep that going for, mm -hmm. for that um, period in New York? Well, there's a couple of interesting things that you, that you bring up there, because, you know, as a parent, I have three boys. They're, my oldest just turned 30. My, my middle one is 25. My youngest is 21, still in college. So I've got two college graduated, one, one in college. And, you know, the, the data points that you as a parent have are, you know, they're, let's face it, they're old. Um, I was talking to somebody about, um, you know, having a Christmas club and going to the bank on a Saturday because it was the only time it was open. And I remember when the very first ATM opened up and it's like, oh my God, I have a card and I can go and I can get money. I mean, it was, it was life changing. The funny thing is my, my pin number, this is kind of a weird one, but the pin number I have now was assigned to me by the bank because you weren't allowed to change it. They mailed it to you. So here I am 40 or 50 years later, and I still use the same pin code that I never picked. So go figure. It's just sort of embedded. But you, you do what you can, but you have, to, you have to update those maps because yeah, you mentioned things like crypto and NFTs. And I look at it and it's like, you know, this is strange and wondrous and interesting stuff, but I can't really wrap my head around exactly what it is from an investment standpoint. I was talking on another podcast and I was using this sort of vessel analogy. I run a couple of mastermind groups, which are younger people. And I teach them about, about investing. We do zoom calls like, like every two weeks. And I was, and there, I was saying, yeah, okay. So, so Bitcoin is a vessel for value, right? Essentially what it is. And what I'm trying to figure out is, is it the Titanic, right? Is it the Lusitania? Is it the Andrea Doria or is it, you know, the HMS Beagle, right? Which is, which was Darwin's ship, right? Is it going to strike an iceberg? 
And obviously Bitcoin, I was away for the month of January. My wife and I went to Africa on a safari and I really scrupulously ignored the markets. And I come back and it's like the world's gone crazy, right? Crypto went from 50 something thousand down to 30 something thousand. You know, it's a big hit for a couple of weeks. Is it going to strike an iceberg or is it just that it's so early that we don't really know where it's all going to go? And it could change the world. Will the blockchain change how transactions are handled, right? Think about the block. Think about something. We'll talk about real estate just for a minute. I'll go down. The, think about uh, title insurance, which I believe is a racket, right? It's a racket. Let's call it what it is. Um, title defects are very rare, but when they happen, they could be cataclysmic. But imagine if the titles, every piece of property, everything that people owned lived on the blockchain was on it was in a verifi verifiable place in that blockchain that that's encrypted and can't be really tinkered with. That's that's life changing for for certain businesses that could put certain businesses out of business, right? They no longer need to exist. That's a massive, massive change. Um, and, but I don't think that we as a society have quite figured it out because it's this is like we're like five minutes into this. Right. NFT is the same thing. My former business partner called me, uh, wants to start a business in NFT for art. And I, my first question out of his mouth is, do you even understand what an NFT is? Because that would make one of us, because I'm not really sure. I'm still figuring that out. And yet economies are going to be built on these concepts. So you better get, you, know, you better learn yourself up on them pretty fast, in my opinion. Anyway, I'll leave you space. And it's disruptions of uh, change, right? Mm -hmm. And adoption is key. And it, and this is where the world is moving. It's People so are going to fight quick. you on disruptions, right? If you think the title insurance companies are going to lay down when Henry Doss decides to start a business where every title to every piece of property goes on the blockchain and their they go out of business, they're going to fight back. Right. So a lot of the tumult that is going on now and and let's let's not kid ourselves again, I'm 62, almost 63 years old. I've lived through varieties of downturns and political discord. If anybody who's out there who's, you know, 30 years old thinks that we're at some unique moment in time with the political dissatisfaction here in this in country and the culture wars, we're not. It's only, the only reason it's amplified is because everybody in the world now has a mouthpiece via Twitter or Instagram or yeah. whoever the fair haired um, uh, platform is to disseminate their innermost thoughts. I mean, we were on this uh, safari and, the, and one of the people we were with and these were strangers to us was taking pictures of everything he ate. Now I know people who do that, but that to me is just kind of weird. I'm like, of all the things to document in your life, you're going to document what you ate. All right. I guess so. I don't know. Um, maybe I'm a Luddite or maybe I'm, I'm out of the mix. This is, but there, there's all this data that's out there floating in the world. Unnecessary, unnecessary noise that's getting amplified. It's one of the reasons we have problems with, you know, COVID disinformation and all of this stuff is everybody's carrying a Hollywood studio in their pocket. And they're not afraid to use it. And how am I going to filter my way through that stuff in order to come up with some intelligent, original thought and apply some critical thinking? It makes my brain hurt just thinking about it. <laughs> so thank you. I really appreciate your, uh, you know, some of the content that you're just providing. I would like to. <laughs> they, I would call you. that a rant i just rant. Went on a rant. I, I, I just want to ask you henry so during those initial years or the decades that you were a business owner what were some of the things that you learned um you were a var you were value added reseller right. uh and there's channel sales on it platforms and you sure. can sell different pieces of hardware software um i actually used to be in that space a little bit so i yeah, kind of so you know this space. It. Um, but outside of that, how long did you do that for? What were some of the pros and cons? What did you like? What you didn't like? And how did it go? Well, we again, so, you, so you're starting in the early 90s. So this is pre-internet, right? Uh, there, was, there were dial-up networks. There were um, uh, EDI networks and other things like that. But they were slow and cumbersome. You know, I, re I remember our first uh, ISDN um, router that we had. Um, 1.5 megabits, I think it was. I thought I died and went to heaven. 
faster than a T1 line. Yeah. Of course, people are like, what the heck is a T1 line? Um, just to give you some context, when the ISP uh, issued that to us, they gave us a C plus three address. I had 64 static IPs. That's what was issued to us. That's how early this was. That's incomprehensible at this stage of the game. I don't even know what you would pay just to get just to pay get one static IP. They're going to nick you for 20, 30 bucks a month or whatever. They gave us 64 right out of the box. I guess nobody ever figured out that, that uh, we were going to run out of these pretty soon. Um, so it was kind of interesting. Uh, so you're still using phones, no real texting. Uh, there were um, in the run up to the web 1.0, which would be 98, 99, 2000, when all these freshly minted companies were coming out, uh, they were they were creating beautiful and wondrous websites. These were all the, the, the first first generation websites. Problem is that they were unusable. There was not enough bandwidth in the world for you to take advantage of these things. And a lot of them crashed and burned. So there was a speculative mania that ended in a sort of a cataclysmic crash. Um, I remember I knew this guy who created, I don't know if this is PG rated or not, but I'm going to tell you this was the real URL. It was called Fucked Company, right? I'm like, how did you get that URL? He says, don't ask. But it was a real thing, a real company, a real website, and people would send in rumors of a company's demise, right? Could you imagine? I mean, that went on for a couple of years. If that wasn't an indication that something bad was going to happen, and then it did. You know, 2001, I guess it was, was the, the dot bomb crash. Um, and it reshuffled the deck, right? A lot of people lost a lot of money, but a few people made a ton of money during that time. Depends on which side of the trade you were on. These things happen. Is that going to happen in the crypto world? Probably. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but it probably will. So, um, so how did you, that. yeah, so going into this business and how did you fare out and what was the pivot to then becoming that coach that you- Well, well my pivot was kind of interesting and I didn't, I, I'm realizing now I didn't answer your question. I went off a, on a tangent. Um, we had 10 good years in that business, my business partner and I. Uh, we had that company, we spawned off a leasing company. So we were, we were leasing um, equipment. So I came up with something that I called the sushi model, right? So the hardware, was the the you know the raw tuna in the center and the um the service contract that we had i created something called a repair 24-hour repair or replace service contract on every piece of equipment that went out because i'm dealing with corporate clients and they really like that so that was the rice that went around the the tuna and then we all we wrapped it in the seaweed which was the leasing right so we would we were doing what are called true operating leases so if a company needed $5 million of equipment, but only had $250,000 in their IT budget, we could make that work for them. So instead of having the capital outlay, we lay out the capital, we lease the equipment back to them. We, we have um, uh, the service on top of it and the leasing costs on top of it. It was like printing money. It was a great, great, great model. The problem that we ran into was, was really twofold. A uh, number one was by the end of the nineties, these, these fair haired companies like buy.com, which I think is now Rakuten, but they were called buy.com. There was so much margin compression and margin erosion that was getting to the point where all of these companies that were trying to sell hardware that we were selling, were, were doing it below our wholesale cost. So margin just evaporated. So that was a that was a huge huge problem, and then of course the you know, when the bomb went off and all the people who were consuming all the stuff that we were that we were providing to them didn't have the capital anymore, even didn't even have the expense budget anymore. Clients disappeared, but th after all of that, that wasn't really what led to the to the breakup of my company. It was the fact that my partner and I, after ten years, weren't seeing eye to eye. And that was really what it was. It was actually the impetus for me to hire my first business coach in 1999 was how do I get out of this engagement with somebody that I don't want to be partners with anymore? And it took a couple of years and it was pretty miserable and it was expensive and it was tough. So the object lesson is be very careful with who you decide to partner with.
because um, your fortunes are intertangled and, and extricating yourself from that is a Herculean task. And it took me three years. It wasn't until later, um, I had a home theater business. I built spec houses. I did a whole bunch of stuff during the, what I guess people called the aughts from like 2000 to 2010. And it was then that I decided as I hit the age of 50 that I'm gonna take all this expertise and I'm gonna share it with people by, by hanging a shingle as a coach. And then one day I said, I'm a business coach. Just like that day that I said, I'm an Apple VAR, right? I announced it to the world, went out and marketed to the world and went from there. So how has it been as a coach? Um, because this is what you do right now. It sounds like this is what your passion and what a lot of people want to eventually become with all the wisdom and experience that you have. Um, and especially giving back, right? Like making mm -hmm. an impact in other people's lives. So um, what is it that makes a good coach versus a bad coach and or the right coach for you? Um, the client is who makes or breaks it. I mean, there are, there are no barriers to entry to becoming a coach. I went through a year of training with coach Phil. I spent a lot of money. I went through all of it. I, I wanted to learn the uh, Marquise of Queensbury rules for being a coach. And so I went through that process. Um, I didn't have to, I could have just said I'm a coach, uh, but I wanted to learn what the coaching world was all about. Then I cherry picked out the things that I liked and I threw away the stuff that didn't work for me. And then I added in all my expertise as a business owner and I created my own imprimatur. I call it coach approach strategic advisor. So I have the coach training, but there will be times where I'm going to act more as a strategic advisor, right? We're going to talk about things that you wouldn't talk about as a coach, right? And there's a concept they call leading. Don't lead your client. To a, to a conclusion. Well, sometimes the conclusion is right there based on years of entrepreneurial experience. I'm not gonna go through silly, torturous games for them to figure this out for themselves. Sometimes I'm just gonna give you the answer, right? So that's just how it is. But the client is the one who will dictate the success or the failure of the relationship. It's just as simple as that. You put the work in, uh, I know I've helped a lot of people. I'm a good coach. I don't, I, at this point in time, I don't have to, I can just say that. I can say, I know I'm a great coach actually, but I can't coach you if you're a crappy client. I just can't. It's just, I mean, that's just the old school boomer in me. If you are not that guy, there's nothing I can do to change that. You have to change that. So uh, is there a specific avatar, persona, type of person that would, fit your kind of ideal type of client list that you feel based on your experience and expertise and wisdom can guide and transform? Well, the, 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 the client, the coachee, whatever you want to call them, number one, they have to be coachable. And not everybody's coachable. And, and what does that times, mean? Maybe, well, maybe it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. It doesn't mean you're a doormat and you're just going to follow me and say, yes, sir. Right. I say jump and you say how high. No, 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 no. It have, there has to be give and take. But think about anything that you're, that you're doing. Um, if you are resisting, right? Resisting things, resisting change, eventually, one of two things are going to happen. You're either going to acquiesce to it and say, okay, resisting is, resistance is futile. I need to change some stuff. Or you're not. And one of the, one of the fundamentals of entrepreneurship is, is this idea of infallibility or invincibility. Most entrepreneurs have a chip on their shoulder and say, you know, hey, just bet against me, right? Just bet against me that what I'm doing is not going to work. Well, my answer is, well, if what you were doing was working, then why are you talking to me? Honestly, you know, in, intrinsically, intuitively, that something is amiss because nobody calls me up and, say, and says, Henry, everything's great in my world, but I need a coach, right? That's a rare cat who does that. I've mentioned this on other podcasts. I talk about Tiger Woods because I'm a golfer. And Tiger Woods, back in his heyday, when he was winning like one out of every two tournaments back in 2002, three, four, he fired his coach and he hired a new guy and he changed his swing. 
I remember he he made a statement where he said he didn't like the way the ball was going into the cup. And I thought to myself, that's really strange because the goal of the exercise is to put the ball in the cup. Do I really care how it goes in the cup if it goes in the cup? Well, that's why he's Tiger Woods. And that's why during that stretch, he was the greatest golfer who ever played. He's playing a different game than everybody else. He was a man playing with children like that. But he was not satisfied because he always knew that he can get better. Now, that's a rare cat. That's a coachable guy who's not afraid to change something that the outside world is looking at and saying, it's not broken. Why are you fixing it? Right? As an entrepreneur, you have got to recognize that something's broken. You're going to pick up the phone and you're going to call me because something's broken. You may not know exactly what it is. And that's where, as a coach, you start. Let's figure out what it is. There's something sticking in your craw. There's something keeping you up at night. What is it? Could be one of a zillion things. I've heard everything under the sun. I can't sleep. I can't manage my, my AR and AP. I'm making money, but no money is translating back to me. I can't manage the people. They're all over the place. I have no processes. Ba 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 ba. It goes on. We have to figure that out. Interesting. Is there a specific um, arena that most clients who reach out to you? are looking for? Is it mainly the finances because that's your expertise? Um, or is there business ownership? Like, because you've been in business, um, mm -hmm. like, is there a specific type of person? Uh, I'm, I'm working on a book. It has the unlikely title of Codfish. And I've talked about this in other podcasts. So what does Codfish stands for? It stands for customer support, operations, development, finance infrastructure, IT, sales and marketing, human resources. I call them the seven silos of, of business. Whether you're a solopreneur like me or you're Apple, a $3 trillion company, you have those seven silos at work. You don't have eight and you don't have six. You got seven, right? Every business on top of that has an origin story and will grow out of one of those silos, right? So my first company, Abacus, um, grew out of the customer support arena. I knew that there was, again, in, in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a, a, an absolute um, knowledge vacuum when it came to computers because they were so new. But we had that. I possessed that. We had we possessed that. So that, that, that was the reason that you wanted to buy from me is because we would provide the customer support that the Comp USAs and the computer stores and all the big monolithic companies that had grown at that time were simply incapable of providing. Uh, but your business may have grown out of something else. Some people that grow out of the finance area or, or you know, HR, right? They had a bunch of people who had, who had skills right? I know a bunch of guys who are really good at SEO. So let's build that sort of thing. A um, lot of different ways to start that story. Um, but what you'll realize very shortly is of those seven silos, there are two that you're probably really good at as an entrepreneur. There are three that you're probably, yeah, I'm okay. I'm passable. And there's, there's probably one or two that are your Achilles heel. You mentioned finance. I've got clients who are as dumb as a box of hair when it comes to finance. Couldn't tell the difference between a balance sheet and an income statement and a statement of cash flows. But I remind them that anything that you're no good at, you can hire somebody who's really, really good at it and passionate about it and lives and breathes it. So go hire a person and don't sit there trying to become an expert in something that you're just not going to become an expert at, right? It's, you're just not. Um, so that's a, that's a key thing. So recognizing those things early on and figuring it out, right? Uh, I like to tell people, look, we want to maximize your strengths and we want to do everything to minimize your weaknesses. And don't tell me that you don't have weaknesses because we all have weaknesses. And the old saying is, if you spend a lot of time working on your weaknesses, what you end up with is a bunch of really strong weaknesses. Why are we wasting our time with that? Right. Well, these are, these are great uh, analogies and great tips, Henry. Mm -hmm. I've always been a big uh, proponent of focus on what you enjoy doing. Have fun doing it and what you're strong at, right? Because there are going to be a lot of people like, you know, how not 
you know who it's it's really like getting people in places where you're not strong at if you're weak at finances hire an accountant or bookkeeper if you're weak at sales and marketing hire an expert in that arena if you're yeah. strong, weak at hr operations there are people um, so focus on what you enjoy doing the most. You wake up passionate, wanting to do more of what you enjoy doing and focus your energy and time because whatever stresses you out will continue stressing you out of course because you're never going to be at the level of someone that's been doing it for 5, 10, 20 years because that's what they breathe, learned and have processes in place to refine their art. Um, and I always take the analogy of like... Uh, a home renovation project. There are done a couple people, of those <laughs> flooring people, window people, roofers. But as a general contractor, you can't be the greatest at painting, electrical, plumbing, flooring, because there's experts in each of these matters. And these are trained experts with 10,000 work hours of 10, 20 years that they can spot a mistake and diagnose it and fix it right away. But nowadays, with information at its disposal, YouTube, you know, social media, mm -hmm. whatever it is, people think they can do everything themselves. And they don't want to pay for an expert because they feel that why waste my money on this when I can figure out myself? Well, that, and, that's, that's called false economy. And I've done some huge renovations over the years, a, a loft department in Manhattan, a house in, in Westchester. So I know it well. I had a home theater business that built stuff. I could build a house from scratch if I, if I want. I have the skills. I know how to frame. I know electric. But here's, there's a couple of things I'm not going to do. I'm not going to go on a roof because if I go on a roof and I fall off, I'm going to get paralyzed. And that's just stupid. I'm going to hire somebody who lives and breathes roofs, right? And I'm not going to do plumbing. Because if I screw the plumbing up, I'm going to be up to my ass and you know what. And I don't want to do that. I'm going to hire a pro. Think of your business the same way, right? What are the, what's the roof? What's the plumbing, right? Focus on the stuff that you're really good with. Or you know what? Don't use your hands at all and work on the design. The, the, what we did when we did our renovations is my wife's a designer. I'm an engineer. We work together to build our own plans. Uh, we hired a general contractor. We knew what we wanted to do. We had a budget set and we went about doing it. But, but I didn't use a hammer or a nail gun. I just supervised people and, and hired them. And then when we ran into situations, um, we would pivot. Or sometimes I would have to look at them and I, would, I, I had a line that I came up with. I would point at something and I would, if I didn't like the way it was done, I would look at it and I would say, does that look professional to you? That's all I had to say appeal to people's pride in how they do their work, right? You ask them, you're going to sign off on that in good conscience? Leave it up to them. Most of the time, they'll redo it and they'll do it the right way, right? But you don't want to end up having to redo a whole bunch of stuff. It's twice as much work and twice as much money. So stay ahead of that in your business. So as far as areas, as far as the silos that people fall down at, it's different for every single case. Some people, like I said, are a box of hair when it comes to finance. Some people have so many numbers and so many metrics, they've got every little piece of data, but they can't figure out what exactly it all means. <laughs> right? I mean, what does it mean? Does it mean you're making money, you're not making money? Where, where are the headwinds that you're facing? Are your margins eroding or is your, is your, um, your staff bloated? Right. Or do you not have enough staff? Or are you going to burn out people and they're going to fall by the wayside? But the biggest issue that I run into with entrepreneurs, and, and I've seen this and I, and I don't mind, mind, mind sharing this, is that just when we start to really make the good progress, they bail. Right. They finally get overtaken by the resistance and say, you know what, this is just too hard. Uh, I'm going to continue to do things the way they're doing, even though I know that it's not really working because it's just too hard for me to change the way that I'm programmed to do this in a better way. That's really me as a coach. That's what frustrates me the most. Yeah. It, it, really, it seems like a lot of really it is dumb. on them, right? It's my, it's all on them. And it's, it's their balance sheet. It's their income statement. It's their employees, right? It's their W2s and their W9s to their, to their contractors. Everything is on them. 
I don't, you know, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm a, I'm an advisor and I'm a coach and I'm a mentor and I'm a cheerleader and I'm, oh, I play all these different roles to make you perform, not make you, but to help you perform the best possible you that you can be. Right. That sounds like a, like a, an infomercial, but really that's what it's all about. It's the whole purpose of, of, it, of being involved in, in, in an engagement here. You're paying me for my expertise, whatever it might be. I adapt to you as opposed to me selling a program that says, if you follow this program, you'll reach the promised land. My personal opinion is those don't work. Because unless it's custom tailored to the way your brain works, eventually it's going to fail. So how do we set up a business for financial success? Because it seems like you have quite a few clients that you're working with coaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone comes from different walks of lives. They have different opinions. They have different goals. Um, but most importantly, they want to grow their wealth or profit sure. or income statement, revenue, um, and whatever it might be. So right. if you don't mind sharing, like what are some of the, the key pillars, some of the, the ways people can start even thinking about how to approach things differently? Well, chapter one of my book is called the psychology of money. So when I, when I wrote, it, I actually wrote it as a course. And then it was later on that I turned it into a book after people said, you should turn this into a book. If that's your lead magnet. Um, so I said, when I wrote it, I, I wrote a, a um, table of contents of 18 chapters. And I, when I wrote it, I started in chapter one and I finished at chapter 18. And the logical place for me to start was the psychology of money. So what does that mean? What's your mindset? Right. I was raised by a woman who was a depression baby. She lived in a scarcity mindset her entire life. She worried about money every single day of her life without, without fail because that's how she was imprinted as, uh, as a youngster, right? Growing up in the depression in Brooklyn in the 1930s. Everybody was poor, nobody had money, nobody had jobs, right? That's what you saw at a young age and that stays with you your entire life, no matter how hard you try. Uh, I inherited a lot of that. I, I think about money every single day. I'm always living in scarcity, even though I have money. Um, I do, I've worked hard to not allow it to get in the way of my living my life because I understand that my most precious asset above and beyond money is time, right? So I'm gonna have, if I'm lucky, 80 years on this planet. I wanna maximize everything that I can do. That doesn't mean it, eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow you may die. But yeah, there's a little bit of that. But we have to achieve a little bit of a balance. So you've gotta understand, am I in that super scarcity mindset? Or am I a riverboat gambler who's just, you know, doing, you know, parlays on FanDuel every five minutes? Or am I somewhere in between, right? So before we can figure out really what your goals are, I got to understand how your brain works, right? I can teach you how to trade stocks. It's not that hard. I mean, really not. But what I can't teach you is how are you going to react when the market takes a 10% or 20% correction, like it kind of was trying to do during the month of January. How are you gonna react? Are you gonna just go into a hole? Are you gonna sell everything? Because if you can't handle the downside risk, uh, you can't really trade, right? There's risk, risk and reward are, you know, uh, two sides of the same coin and you've and, gotta and manage that. And this is great because I've seen a lot of business owners giving up during this pandemic. Sure. And uh, it's interesting to see how they react in certain situations and circumstances. Sure. Um, and time tells a lot of things in terms of how people perceive things, how they, you know, run their business, run their lives, because if they're at the pulse on news or anything that scares them, then you know, are they the type of people that you want to work with as a coach or even want to partner with as a business owner? So I run an agency and I, I feel mm -hmm. like people I want to work with is long term, want to really focus on their real progress, right? Growth, 
building authority, et cetera. So for me, that's the type of people I want to work with, but they have to be clear on that. And they have to understand that when things are bad, what happens when things are great, everyone doesn't bother you. You know, no, no one complains. It's all kumbaya, right? But the, you know, the last two years, I'm, I'm sure you've seen and heard and, you know, the people that you've worked with have expressed a lot of concerns. Maybe share some stories um, because I know, oh, yeah, because I mean, last two years, it's really been working on people's mind, right? Like this pandemic has really affected a lot of people in different walks of lives, different areas from personal relationships, business, um, every, everything really. Well, when the pandemic hit um, March of 2020, we actually happened to be in Park City, Utah skiing because that's where my, you know, our youngest son goes to college. So the whole family was out there. And, you know, we're, we're skiing and, and having dinner and had a bunch of his roommates and friends over and, and Trump comes on TV on March 11th and says we're locking the country down for two weeks and then we're just, okay, we're having fun here. <laughs> and that was like, wow, this is really, really serious stuff. And then we got back, I opened up my coaching practice for April, May and June for three months um at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020 i opened it up to anybody who wanted i put put a couple of notes on some different networks i'm part of and i had over 100 conversations with probably 60 different people sort of lost count i thought maybe i'd get one or two people who wanted to talk about things and it's like all of a sudden i was overwhelmed happily so and i started every conversation with the same thing i said look your business went from doing, you know, 20,000 MRR. I think the first person I talked to was in the travel business. Their, her business went from 20,000 MRR to zero overnight. Just ended, fell off a cliff. And I said, Just for the listeners, MMR, MRR is monthly oh, recurring sorry. revenue. Monthly recurring. Thank you, John. I should be careful using, um, yes, monthly recurring revenue, right? Nice little business, very low overhead went kaplooey and i said listen if this stays like this until the end of 2021 you're going to be okay are you going to be able to feed your family and do this when i asked that same question to everybody and universally people said yeah you know i might have to live like gandhi but i think i'll be able to 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 get through that now that was at that time in in march i used my crystal ball and i said based on the the the, the pandemic of 1918 and the data that I have available to me, we should probably be coming out of this at the end of 2021, which was basically a month ago, because we're doing this on, uh, what's today's date, January 31st of 2022. Obviously, I was young and foolish when I came up with that concept. But yeah, I said, you, you got to just look at circling the wagons and saying okay this is an extreme black swan event you got to see whether we can what we can do just to make sure that everybody's fed and happy and healthy and survived it very very it's like the bottom rung of maslow's pyramid of of needs right and if um, your viewers aren't familiar with that just google it you'll see a little you know pyramid that shows you what the basic needs are sleep food you know, water, that's kind of at the base level. So when the, when the, um, uh, when, a, when a black swan event, right, a, an unpredictable cataclysmic event comes, people tend to circle their wagons and look at the most basic things that they need in order to survive. And if you can check all of those things off, you're probably in pretty good shape because no matter how bad they are, they don't last forever. I remember when it first happened for a couple months into it, one of my, you know, the kids were depressed about it. And I said, hey, your grandmother lived through five years of World War II, right? My mother was in high school and started college during World War II. And she used to tell us the stories about that. You know, there were no men around. And if there were men around, you just assumed there was something wrong with them because every able-bodied man was over there fighting the Nazis and fighting in, in the Pacific theater. Right. That's just how it was. Everything was rationed. It was, you know, it was really pretty terrible. But yet they all did it and they all managed. I said, that's five years. You've been doing this for five months. Right. So get a little get a little context to things. 
right? Move down to basic to, to the basics, and then you can look at okay, what can what can I do out of the ashes of this? I'm in the travel business, and nobody's traveling. So what do we do? Well, we've got to go and we have to look at what your core competencies are. What is it that you do well? And how can that be repositioned into something that people do need? And that's where you start. Always knowing in the back of your mind that this is not a permanent change. It's a transitory event. This too shall pass. And I thought it was really important for people to, to recognize that fact. Right? When you're in the hurricane, you can't tell. You just never think the wind's ever going to stop. And then one day it does. And one day this will stop too. Hopefully not too distant future. We'll see. And, and I love you mentioning like contact perspective because if you are too comfortable with what you have, you have to relate right, to how your parents, your grandparents, or other people in different parts of the world are, you know, having their lives disrupted right like mm -hmm. if you feel in north america we can't have gasoline well you know certain parts of africa don't even get water on a daily basis right like put yourself in other people's shoe and then realize that life is not that bad overall we still have choice we still have internet we still have you know food and shelter like there's people out there that they, they're just wishing one day things can change in their- There are know, 3 billion so people on this planet who do not have access to clean water. I mean, we just came back from Africa. We were in exactly. Kenya on safari and we're seeing how these people live and what it is that they have to do. They live on, you know, $3,500 a year, yeah. right? They're very resourceful. Nothing goes to waste. They repurpose everything. Um, they live a very carbon neutral life. It's pretty amazing. It's almost embarrassing as a Westerner to go there and realize um, one day one of the Maasai uh, tribesmen who was taking us on our, our game rides, we were taking photographs. He picked up a stone and he started you know, filing his nails with it, right? I have the stone. He gave it to me. He said, this, this is, is, he says, this is what we use for, you know, personal hygiene. We take a, we pick this rock. It has a nice little surface on it. And we use that to file our fingernails. And I concept. love you. I love you mentioning South Africa because not only that, like if you're able to travel to not just worse Western countries and first world countries, go to second, third, fourth world countries, right? Sure. Like learn to see what you are. Other people live because First, we're Western countries. We comprise of what? 5%, 10% of population in small, the global small world. Number. So if you believe that what we have is scarcity and not enough, go there. Live there for a month. Live there for a couple of days. See if you can endure that. Because I'm a right. big traveler. I love going to third world countries to see how other people ingrain myself in cultures to really understand that we're so fortunate. We're so lucky to have everything we have, choice, abundance um but people take it for granted and that's mm -hmm. where you know being exposed to a lot of different situations and knowledge of societies gives you more of an appreciation of what you have um so yeah. i know we've taken a lot of time henry um can you share with the audience members what's the best way to reach out to you um, if there are some last final nuggets that you would love to share, that'd be great. All right. Well, you can reach me a couple of different ways. Um, my, my personal site is henrydoss.com. So that, that kind of has an aggregation of, of all my sites, my, my business coaching, my financial coaching, you know, link to my real estate. So if you want to buy a house in Connecticut or sell a house in Connecticut, I'm your guy. Um, and my baseball card collection and my golf trips. I have to add, uh, um, I think I have to add a section for this safari because we took 20,000 photos, my wife and I, and I've been kind of combing through them. Um, you, you made an interesting point. Do you know that only one in 10 Americans will actually visit a foreign country in their entire life? That's a, that's a mind boggling statistic. And I've been all over the globe. Um, yeah, maintaining perspective and what it is that you do, 
uh, and where it is and how blessed and fortunate you are to live in arguably and regardless of all the dysfunction that you read about and, and you see on CNN or Fox News or whatever, um, we are, America is a brilliant ex experiment that for the most part has worked out amazingly well. Um, we take for granted our, our freedoms. We take for granted, I think sometimes our ability to speak out about things that we don't like without repercussions. When you look at um, at uh, other countries that are suppressing human rights, um, it's pretty it's pretty frightening what's out there in the world. So don't again don't don't lose perspective on that. But anyway, so you can go to henrydoss.com. You can download my book FQ Financial Intelligence for free, one hundred percent off. It'll take you to Book Baby, and you'll you'll get a um, a coupon, which I think I have to update because it probably expired. Um, but yeah, I encourage people to read it. Uh, if you want to engage me, you can click on, uh, you can go to uh, Das Knowledge, D-A-A-S Knowledge, which is my business site. And you can click on the get my help and set up a strategy session. I don't charge for any, any of that. I'm happy to talk to people. Uh, when well, you want to talk about business, you want to talk about finance, you want to talk about, I don't know, baseball cards. I don't really care. Happy to do it. That's what I do. Amazing. Um, that's it. Well, thanks a lot, Henry. I really appreciate your time. Uh, ultra blessed to have this opportunity to you know learn a little bit about yourself share Thank with you, the John. listeners about you know what have you been up to how you can share and help so many other aspiring entrepreneurs in their journey and hopefully shrink time and that's the key piece that a lot of people want they want to be efficient and by reaching out to a coach or mentor someone that has already walked through the, the mm -hmm. challenges and tribulations, you're going to make less mistakes, hopefully. hopefully. Uh, so thanks a lot, Henry, uh, for all the great insight and knowledge that you share with us today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.